This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Before we begin, I, I just want to say if, if we do have any veterans with us today, hats off to you and thank you for your service and, uh, and sacrifice. Um, you know, this obviously is uh, an important day uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, just a second, I'm, I'm just signaling a colleague there through the window. Um, and uh, also just like to um, welcome everybody to what, what number long table is this now? One, 100 something? Forgetting. Austin will know the number, I'm sure, but I've forgotten. So we're, we're 116. 116, right. So the 116th long table since we started, God knows what, 116 weeks ago. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and it is my pleasure to introduce Eduardo Garcia Molina, who was a uh, summer seminar student uh, with us this last summer. So this was the class that we had accepted for 2020, which of course was canceled because of the pandemic, told that group that they would be welcome back for the class of 2021. Uh, that uh, summer seminar, of course, was canceled as well. So five out of the eight students, including Eduardo, were able to join us this last summer uh, um, for the 2022 summer seminar. So we're um, very glad that uh, we, we were able to have that group uh, join us this summer. Um, Eduardo is a graduate student at the University of Chicago in the Classics Department, where he is furiously dissertating um, after spending the summer with us. Um, he is going to be talking with us today uh, on the topic of his summer seminar um, project, which is the so-called bottle cap coins of Seleucus IV, a really enigmatic uh, group of uh, coins and uh, production techniques. So, Eduardo. Um, do explain to us what these coins are all about, please. So, oh, you will you will be sick uh, mm -hmm. of these coins for the time. I, I'm sure uh, uh, many of my my wonderful uh, the familiar faces that I've seen over the summer. Thank you all for for being here. It really is a, a delight to see you all again. I, I I must apologize that I'm subjecting you all to another discussion uh, over these serrated coins, a, a source of continued uh, equal parts frustration and fascination. Uh, and I, of course, thank you all for your patience and genuine support that you all showed over the summer. Um, this is still a work in progress. Uh, so I thank you all in advance for any questions, suggestions, emendations, disapprobations, what have you. Um, so I will now share my screen. And is the everything is good with the presentation? You all can see this. Perfect. Looks great. All right. So. I came to the summer seminar with this coin in mind. This was the my green light, if you allow me a Gatsby in reference. Uh, this is the the my object that I really wanted to study because of this wonderful reverse with an elephant holding a torch. You don't see a lot of elephants doing things with their trunks, especially on coins, especially on Seleucid coins. Uh, so I was fascinated by this coin of Antiochus the Sixth Dionysus, uh, a very short lived. Uh, young uh, Seleucid king. Um, I showed this to Peter during our first uh, uh, meeting because Peter is my advisor. And Peter, in, in much nicer uh, terms, went, and and I had nothing uh, uh, to, to further on aside from this uh, uh, fascination with this iconogra uh, iconographical element here. So I did what you do, and I just stared at the coin. And I grew increasingly, increasingly fascinated by these uh, serrations. So I decided to go back to the source, as it were. So this is where we're at now. Pre and proceeded by arguably two of the most prominent Seleucid monarchs, much of Seleucus IV's 12-year reign is shrouded in uncertainty. A consequence of this is that his rule has drawn little attention compared to those of his predecessor, Antiochus III, and his successor, Antiochus IV both of whom are much better attested in sources and have been the subject of scholarly monographs and conferences. Nevertheless, Seleucus IV, who has generally been described as a feeble king by ancient sources, assumed the throne and reign during a significant time in Seleucid history. While the severity of their impact is still subject to debate, it is clear that the conquest of Koile Syria and Phoenicia, the loss of Asia Minor, 
and the stipulations codified in the Treaty of Apamea in 188 that followed the Seleucid defeat in the Roman Seleucid War affected the subsequent governance of the Hellenistic Empire. This project is interested in the noted increase in Seleucid monetary experimentation that defines much of the second century and argues that such trends were visible during the reign of Seleucus IV as he sought to tighten the administration of Northern Syria, Poly Syria, and Phoenicia. You will hear these three regions uh, said, uh, throughout this presentation a lot, I assure you. It is within this context that a particular issue of Seleucid bronzes was introduced under Seleucus IV. These coins are largely noted for their unique serrated edges, leading them to be referred to as quote unquote bottle cap coins. Such a striking choice has been largely explained as a stylistic one, but this presentation and the overall project wishes to expand this reading of the serrations and contextualize their introduction within the restructuring of Seleucid minting habits and broader administrative practices during this time. It is argued that form is congruous with function, that the serration and other innovations of Seleucus IV's bronzes indicate a change in the way that the Seleucid administration operated and represented itself. And here I focus about, it's not just the serrations. Uh, these coins also feature, for example, new iconographical elements that I will discuss that we've never seen before in Seleucid coinage before this period. There's also this wonderful instance where you have um, control marks on both the obverse and the reverse. There's also the wonderful central cavities that start popping up in these bronze issues uh, during the production of these coins in addition to the serrations. So it's more than just the serrations, although of course that's the thing we, we most uh, pick up on and rightfully so because it's, so they're really interesting. Um, such innovations, I believe, were spurred by the changing geopolitical situation, especially the acquisition of the former Ptolemaic territories of Poly Syria and Phoenicia and Seleucid responses to these regions' monetary customs. Instead of just the stylistic choice, the production of serrated bronzes with their uniform iconography and further innovations forms an under-discussed link within the greater chain of Seleucid monetary experimentation and administrative reorganization in the second century as the empire reacted to a multitude of exterior and interior pressures before its ultimate disintegration in the first century. Following a string of Roman victories over Seleucid forces, Antiochus III ended the conflict by signing the Treaty of Apamea in 188. There is no need to enumerate all the stipulations. A brief reiteration of the ones relevant to our current discussion will suffice. The cessation of Seleucid rule and further claims over the lucrative territories beyond the Taurus mountain range, most of Asia Minor. The prohibition of elephants and warships above a certain number and size. The surrender of hostages, including one royal stock, uh, that will come into play later on after our story, um, and the payment of indemnities to the Romans and Eumenes of Pergamon through an initial lump sum, 3,000 talents, to be followed by yearly installments of 1,000 talents for 12 years, so 12,000 talents overall, in addition to a payment of 350 talents to Eumenes spread over five years. Notably, the Romans demanded these sums be paid in high quality silver coinage under the Attic standard. The overall impact these stipulations had on the Seleucid state has been the subject of various scholarly discussions. Current sentiments, more or less Congress when Larry Dare's erudite examination of Seleucid silver debasement, or more precisely, lack thereof, during the reign of Seleucus IV, favor a conservative reading of the pressures these stipulations exerted on the Seleucid Empire. There is certainly no visible reactionary debasement in Seleucid silver, and at least one uh, of the scant literary sources for this period attests to Seleucus IV having the means to amass a considerable force. This is Diodorus, and he calls it axiolo axiologon dunamin. Um, when he debated joining uh, Pharnacus's campaign against Eumenes II, debasement, while a useful trend to account for periods of financial hardship that we will generally label as crises, should not also be taken as the sole financial choice available. One must also consider the open monetary policy of the Seleucids, wherein debasement carried far greater consequences for the mercantile standing of the polity in the interconnected trade networks of the Hellenistic Mediterranean. Even in a closed currency system like we find with the Lagids in Egypt, however, policies of debasement are relatively rare, 
as a recent metrological study uh, by Fouché and Olivia has demonstrated. Additionally, there are other means of manipulating coinage circulating within the empire. The open monetary policy utilized by the Seleucids allowed for a degree of flexibility. Since Seleucid coins circulated alongside non-Seleucid coins, uh, with some modern estimates presenting a ratio of one to two in favor of non-Seleucid coinage. This heterogeneous circulation, unified by the usage of the attic system, would have allowed for selectivity in the coinage to, uh, used for the yearly payments of Apamea, since the Romans demanded silver coins under the attic standard with no provision concerning their origin. When one also accounts for the loss of Asia Minor in a fruitless final campaign, the numerous years of constant warfare by his predecessor, and events that hint at financial duress, notably the despoliation of the Temple of Bel and Elam by Antiochus III in 187, it would be surprising if there were no financial strain. Note I employ here the word strain, not collapse or crisis. This is not an argument uh, for a wholesale crisis that typically leads to instances of debasement, but it does wish to press uh, Larry Dare's uh, characterization of the payments as un charge irritant. Uh, there is clear pressure, uh, which coincides with an increased effort to monetize the Western portion of the empire. The question of monetization is one of immediate import to this conversation. Recent works, most notably Yosef's articles on the subject, have pushed against notions of high levels of monetization in the Hellenistic kingdoms. Moreover, Yosef has calculated that the average supply of new Seleucid silver coinage was around 185 talents per year, much less than the required thousand talents of silver coins demanded by the Treaty of Apamea, which Seleucus appeared to have actually paid. Um, even if we are generous with the numbers presented in this study, it seems likely that the requirements of Apamea for payment in silver coinage would have affected the Seleucid silver supply in addition to the physical labor and financial cost of minting new coins. It has also been noted, for instance, that production in what was arguably the main mint of the Seleucid Empire, Antiochia on the Orontes, appeared to slow down and halt under the final years of Antiochus III and was later reorganized and reopened under Seleucus IV. Why am I discussing this when I'm looking at bronzes? It is no coincidence, I believe, that Antiochia began to eclipse, uh, eclipse every other mint in the Seleucid Empire during this period following Apamea. To quote Yosef in his 2015 article about the wealth of the Seleucids and Lagids, the decade 180 to 171 is transitional since the coins produced in the Levant and Syria are almost equal in number to those produced by local mints in Babylon and Mesopotamia. After that date, the Levantine productions take the lead, marking the unquestionable primacy of Antioch. I hang here on the word transitional. I am not claiming Seleucus IV implemented a total overhaul of the Seleucid administration, far from it. Many of these systems were in place before, and as we know, there would be further innovations going forward. What I am in favor of, however, is emphasizing this transitional aspect during his reign and seeing it as a product of the financial strain, not crisis, that the Treaty of Apamea presented to the low monetized Seleucid polity and the need to administer uh, new regions, Coily, Syria, and Phoenicia, which saw the rise of Antiochia as the main Seleucid mint in terms of production. The, Seleucid, uh, the Seleucids and Lagids fought a series of conflicts over possession of Coily, Syria, and Phoenicia until they were made into Seleucid territory by the victory of Antiochus III at Paneon in 198. It has been generally accepted that the Seleucids sought to maintain the closed, monetary, uh, the closed Ptolemaic monetary system in these regions after their conquest, likely as a precaution lest they disturb, apologies for the uh, noise, the, the wonderful uh, background noise of Chicago, I will begin again. It has been generally accepted that the Seleucids sought to maintain the closed uh, Ptolemaic monetary system in these regions after their conquest, likely as a precaution, lest they disturb the commerce and tax systems that were placed by the Lagids and have been employed throughout the third century. While no new Ptolemaic silver was allowed in, what was there was allowed to circulate freely. Rather happily, this also meant that they did not have to worry about rounding up, restriking, and redistributing silver. Any lack of face for allowing silver with Ptolemaic iconography to circulate, while Seleucid presence was relegated to a baser metal, bronze, 
was apparently not great enough to merit restriking or at the very least even countermarking. As scholars have noted, this decision was a pragmatic one. Apologies, my cat is now in the thing. Uh, perfect. Um, as scholars have noted, this decision was a pragmatic one. The region was recently conquered and the main goal of the state was the extraction of resources. A rapid change in monetary system would have brought unneeded difficulties and strained relations with local elites and merchants. I will not go into all the details here because frankly, it would easily dominate the remainder of my time. But there is also a discussion among scholars, most recently renewed by Lorber, on a particular passage in Josephus that suggests the Seleucids and Lagids actually split the tax revenue from these territories after their Seleucid territory, or uh, as a way of cementing relations after Antiochus III marries his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemaeus V. If this is so, it appears that Seleucus IV was displeased by the situation and, has, uh, as Honigman has suggested, sought to take over the other share of the tax revenues after the death of Ptolemaeus V in 180 or Cleopatra I in 176. I'm still working through uh, how to view these bronzes within such a context, but my initial thoughts, regardless of their controversy over tax farming shares, are relatively congruous with those espoused recently by Dura that bronze coinage served as a way for the Seleucids to enter into the closed monetary system of the Southern Levant, where Ptolemaic bronzes had been utilized before and were pushed out of circulation astonishingly quickly by Seleucid bronzes. Before we look at the coins, do we have any further evidence under the reign of Seleucus IV for administrative overhaul? While scanty, there are some examples that have to do with temple revenue. The first, I assure you, you do not have to read all that, the first is the appointment of Olympiodorus to oversee the temples and their revenue in Koili Syria and Phoenicia around 178. Of course, in this letter, the post is couched in rather flowery language, as is common for these appointments. But note also the inclusion of Heliodorus, who was Seleucid's chief minister, uh, who was later infamously immortalized following the incident detailed in 2 Maccabees. It is said that he, who would also uh, later purportedly assassinate Seleucus IV, was ordered to take the revenues from the temple of Jerusalem and as described in Maccabees, was only thwarted in this endeavor by divine intervention. This is the, the depiction that I chose as the, the title slide here, uh, painted by Raphael, this is in the Apostolic Palace. Note also that Julius II, the Pope who commissioned this, is watching the scene unfurl uh, from the left-hand side. Um, we do not have time to wade into this discussion fully, but this scene, painted in rather stark colors by your ex and sources, was likely an attempt by a Seleucid official to carry out a rather routine assessment and extraction of temple resources. Feelings were likely stoked by the fact that Antiochus III had, according to one source, given concessions to the temple during his reign, and Seleucus was attempting to exert back control. This trend of increasing administrative oversight is now corroborated by the recent publication in 2020 of a tablet of the so-called Babylonian astronomical diaries housed in the Abbey Museum in Queensland, Australia. In among the lines pertaining to the levels of rivers and the charts of the stars is this segment that discusses an official with the title Zazaku. It was initially thought the office, which later documents revealed carry the function of royal official in the Ezagil Temple in Babylon, was reinstated under Antiochus IV and V. Now, however, it appears that the earliest dating for the resurrection of the office, whose last attested use before this was during the Achaemenid period, can be placed within the later portion of Seleucus IV's reign. This official oversaw royal interests at the temple and was responsible for examining the income of the temple to make sure that the royal piece of the pie was protected. While there are unavoidable gaps in our evidence, it is becoming clear that Seleucus's much maligned reign, chastised for its specificity and greed by ancient and some modern historians, was one of consolidation and restructuring. Some of his decisions were unpopular. Uh, uh, for instance, Heliodorus in the temple. And the peacefulness of his reign goes against the ancient and modern picture of Hellenistic kingdoms resting on being inherently bellicose. This further point needs stress. Hellenistic polities, including Rome, were fueled by intermittent injections of spoils and, and newly acquired territories. It appears that Seleucus, 
likely hamstrung in military endeavors by the stipulations of Apamea that disallowed for Western expansion and the accumulation of weapons of war, sought to relieve the stresses brought uh, about onto the state by a substantial military defeat and the loss of territory by restructuring what he already possessed a trend that would continue on with his successors to varying degrees of efficacy, I assure you. While the overall scale of coin production under Seleucus IV may be questioned in the face of data that shows a downward trend, there does appear to be a contraction of minting activity in the 12 years of Seleucus IV's reign when compared to his more bellicose predecessor, who also ruled for a considerably longer period and successor that might partly account for this slump. Here I put up uh, two maps shown in SCC. It took 20 minutes. Uh, but note that the data is skewed since Antiochus III had more territory, a longer rule, and raised temporary mints, which inflated the number of mints uh, on the map. But notably in Northern Syria, Phoenicia, and Coeli Syria, there appears to be less mints active under Seleucus IV during the considerable length of his reign. With Antiochus IV's policies, we then see an increase in mints as cities are given the right, or rather the onus, of minting quasi-municipal coins. During the reign of Antiochus III, minting activity is discernible at varying times in Tyre, Aketolemais, Aridos, Laodikia, Apamea, Antiochia, in addition to bronze mints likely in military colonies and temporary mints during the Fifth Syrian War. Aketolemais started minting bronzes after 198, in the name of Antiochus III, but only in small denominations, denomination D, um, and uh, with little in the way of control marks and with a, quote, crude style compared to those of Antiochia. Tyre was granted minting rights under Antiochus III, and its coinage enjoyed considerable regional circulation during his reign, but it appears that the mint closed under Seleucus IV and only reopened in 178-177. As opposed to Antiochus's reign, Tyrian bronze coinage, which are unserrated, appear to have seen a decrease not only in terms of production, but also in circulation during the reign of Seleucus IV. Interestingly, the bronze coinage of Tyre included the portrait of Seleucus IV on the obverses of all denominations, a clear affirmation of who's ultimately in charge, while serrated issues in Antiochia and later Aketolemais bear no image of him likely due to their production in state-controlled mints or under the close supervision of Seleucid officials, as we'll see later on. In Northern Syria, Antiochia becomes the dominant mint after the possible brief closure discussed above and begins the production of a bronze series that are striking departure from previous types and feature serrated edges, uniform iconography that is linked to denominations and exhibit new figures, control marks on both the reverse and obverse, and central cavities that occur very rarely in previous Seleucid bronzes, but were relatively commonplace in Ptolemaic bronzes before this period. As mentioned in the introduction, scholarship on this issue of bronzes has largely been comfortable with labeling this as a stylistic choice. When one considers the new demands on the minting process, in addition to other factors, a singularly stylistic choice appears too simple for such a market shift in minting practices in Antiochia and later Aketolemais. Serration on coins has little precedent before this issue. The only comparable evidence is from a series of concurrent bronzes from Antigone in Macedonia under Philip V and his son Perseus, and some Cappadocian bronzes that were either minted under Ariatis IV, Ariarathes, excuse me, the fourth, the fifth, or the tenth. It has been suggested that the Seleucid serration was the result of the increased relations between the Antigonid and Seleucid kingdoms that began under Antiochus III and Philip V, and emblematized in Polybius's scathing account of the pact between those two kings. This uh, uh, relation was then later reaffirmed when Seleucus IV married his daughter, Laodice V, to Perseus in 178-7. While this may serve as the inspiration for the serration, Wholesale emulation does not satisfyingly explain why this practice was transferred to Antiochia and why it continued to be employed alongside more traditional designs at Antiochia and other mints for roughly 60 years after their introduction. Additionally, the dating of the Macedonian issues is difficult, and as is noted by Morcom, 
the serrated design could have just as easily originated in Seleucid Syria and then found its way into Antigonid mints. The original attribution of the serrated design as an Antigonid fabrication is thus at least questionable. Since chronology is currently the topic at hand, it is also interesting to note that these serrated bronzes possibly appeared during times of Antigonid and Seleucid monetary reforms in the face of war indemnities after engagements with the Romans. It is curious that these serrations appear in moments where both the Antigonid and Seleucid states are pushing for more intensive collection of taxes and fees through administrative restructuring following a substantial military defeat. If the Cappadocian issues are placed in the reign of the IV, they coincidentally appear possibly after the king is made to give indemnities to the Romans for his role in helping Antiochus III. Even if such a pattern uh, of adoption is coincidental, the usage of serrated bronzes by the Antigonids, Seleucids, and Ariarathids at various points invites a re-examination of the process by which these coins are produced and their value beyond simply that of style. In terms of production, the serrated form demanded that new molds be made from which the flans could be produced. The crafting of these molds, which were double-sided, was certainly more intensive as a result of the shape, and the number of serrations naturally decreased with each smaller denomination, though not as drastically as initially thought. It bears explicitly stating that these serrations are from the molding process and not scored afterwards with a chisel like we see in later Roman denarii. Following the standard practice for bronzes, the value of these coins was largely fiduciary. A cursory examination of the metrological data, however, reveals that, these, uh, that the larger denomination, A, was smaller in both diameter and weight under Seleucus IV, while the lower denominations, C, D, and E, all appear to have been made larger and heavier alongside with the resurfacing of denomination B, which had not been produced in Antiochia under Antiochus III. This closing of the weight disparity among these coins along uh, with the usage of consistent iconography for each denomination does appear to be a way of standardizing bronzes and giving these issues a certain fixity. While the fabric of the flan demanded greater care, it is still evident that quality control was not exercised as frequently when it came to standardizing the weight of these bronzes and ensuring minimal striking errors. Both of these aspects are unsurprising given the fiduciary value of these coins and their mass production as smaller change, which saw quality control lessen when compared to silver and gold coinage. Tetradrams minted in Antiochia during this period also feature different control marks from the serrated bronzes, possibly indicating that the mint had different officials in charge of different coinage. However, the lack of quality control with respect to weight, mold remnants, and striking errors does not necessarily mean these coins were neglected. In a stark departure from previous Seleucid bronzes, serrated ones feature control marks on both the obverse and the reverse. In the later issues from Ptolemaeus Ake, the control mark mirrors the one used on the obverse of those in Antiochia. This has been suggested to mean that the mint official of Antiochia was actually moved down to instruct workers on the new practices and to oversee the production of these new issues in a new mint. In addition, these serrated bronzes are also the first time we see central cavities being consistently employed by a Seleucid mint. There are two prior examples that I could find. Um, bronzes from Seleucus II in an undisclosed mint and bronzes minted entire under Antiochus III. Such cavities, however, are common for bronzes minted by the Ptolemies. While we do not know uh, the mint that produced divided bronzes under Seleucus II, Tyre under Antiochus III makes sense since they did and didn't, uh, it, since they did indeed, since they did indeed mint Ptolemaic bronzes with central cavities and continued the practice under Seleucid rule. The purpose of the central cavity, uh, which we see sporadically in other mints across space and time, is still somewhat uncertain. Fouché, in his experimental work on minting coins, has proposed rather convincingly that these cavities were the result of the preparation of the bronze flans for striking. More specifically, 
The cavities help coins stand on a lathe where they could be smoothed and polished before striking to ensure a level surface. This is bolstered by some blank flans that we now have that show circular scorings, and I have one on the screen for you here. Notably, the lathe did not appear to clamp down on both sides, um, explaining why the cavities on the obverse and reverse very frequently are off-center uh, and are not in the same place on both sides. For the serrated bronzes, the central cavity certainly helped the bronzes be recognized as legitimate currency in regions where the Ptolemies once held sway and spread their own bronzes before. However, I also think this practice was demanded partly by the serrated fabric, which required a flat surface for striking more so than uh, of previous fabrics. Any unevenness in the main body or in the serration would have been grinded down. I have, uh, I have to look more into the fabric of Antiochian coins prior to this, but it does appear the lathe polishing helped facilitate the striking of these serrated coins, though it was not apparently a requirement since there are some later serrated coins with no cavities and we see uh, unserrated coins with the cavities as well and the Ptolemaic coins are unserrated with these cavities. The new methods introduced into Seleucid minting practices with these serrated bronzes show an increase in attention by the state to bronzes to boost their status as legitimate currency in newly administered regions wherein Seleucid bronzes had not been the only bronze currency, similar to Antigone and Macedonia. Such choices make these coins stand out. It must be said, and this has been learned through the opportunity of personally visiting the ANS and going through its collection, that the feel of the serrations truly make these coins uh, different uh, from an experiential perspective of a holder uh, just examining these coins, uh, uh, somewhat analogous to the reeded edges that we see in US quarters and dimes, although certainly more pronounced than them. The added steps almost certainly also made attempts at counterfeiting much harder since the process of casting serrated flans was more intensive in addition to the inclusion of control marks and divots on both sides. I actually started counting the serrations from bronzes housed in the ANS over the summer in what can I assure you was a riveting morning uh, and found that there was a general pattern in how many are included per denomination, possibly further helping attempts at spotting sloppily struck substitutes. Interestingly, many of these practices did not transfer to the Eastern mints of the empire, which continued to produce unserrated coins with no central cavities of various denominations with differences in diameter and weights from those at Antiochia. Unsurprising, given that Seleucid bronzes were likely the only bronzes circulating in those Eastern regions as opposed to the Western regions. The use of Antiochia as the main mint for these bronzes is a deliberate one. One would expect local mints to be allowed to continue like we see in Tyre in a territory as monetized when compared to other regions and lucrative as Phoenicia and Coily Syria. This is certainly what occurs during the reign of Antiochus IV. Such a decision is even more pronounced when one accounts for the relatively low circulation pattern of bronzes, typically not traveling far from their minting locations. These serrated bronzes, however, were moved to the south from Antiochia, an additional burden complication for the state if such a move was a concerted effort. This was likely not a singular occurrence too, since these coins pop up with relative frequency in Coily, Syria, and Phoenicia. Excuse me. There had to be some financial gain underlying this decision. And as we discussed earlier, it is clear that this is part of an attempt to impose bronze uniformity in a newly conquered region that operated under a closed system. It was a further way of encroaching on that system and extracting resources without destabilizing it. Parallels can be drawn between this and the opening of mints in Cilicia in the middle of the third century by the Seleucids to foster the monetization of the region, which was similarly contested by the Ptolemies. I pause here to also thank Alain Brisson for uh, noting in his personal correspondence to me a parallel example of distribution for the Philotyroi and Sistophoroi of uh, Pergamon to Phrygian Apamea in Asia Minor. The production of bronzes at Ptolemais Ake appears to have been started later in Seleucus IV's reign 
and was relegated to a smaller denomination, C, and was overseen by the same official from Antioquia due to his control mark appearing in coins minted there. I should note, before we turn to the final section on iconography, that scholars have generally linked the production of bronze and more precious metal coinage under the Seleucids to payments for soldiers. I offer no repudiation of this claim, which has found general acceptance, but do wish to tease out what such implications mean for these coins. If soldiers are the main motivation behind their production and the spreaders of these coins, instead of say a more purposeful shipping of new coins in bulk into a region, an interesting dynamic is presented with Antiochia being the center for the production and distribution of these coins. It would make sense since two of the regions wherein the coins circulated, whether Syria and Phoenicia, were recently taken and their security would demand increased military presence in the form of garrisons. If the main vehicles for the diffusion of the new currency were soldiers, however, why are so many new innovations introduced? And who accepted these coins from soldiers? They look weird. Uh, uh, we are treading on shakier ground, but it appears to me that the main anxiety behind the innovations is one of trust. Um, that is to say that Seleucid bronzes, due to their fiduciary nature, needed to display a variety of signifiers that would lead audiences, particularly those in Coeli, Syria, and Phoenicia, which have dealt with Ptolemaic bronzes before, to recognize their value and possibly differentiate Seleucid bronzes from Ptolemaic remnants still in circulation. Before I wrap up uh, the project, let us take a brief look at some of the iconograph uh, iconographical elements displayed on the bronzes themselves. Denomination A, the largest, offers a fairly programmatic design that is replicated in a variety of Seleucid coins. We have Apollo, the heavenly progenitor of the stock of Seleucus, wearing what scholars have deemed an archaic hairstyle on the obverse and a nude standing Apollo resting on a tripod and inspecting his arrow on the reverse. Denomination D features Apollo as well, but the reverse, um, excuse me, uh, but the reverse has him assuming a seated position on an omphalos. Again, fairly programmatic to Saluki coinage. Denomination B, features a prowl on the reverse, another the rarity on Seleucid royal coinage before this period, and a symbol of naval might that would have resonated with many, but especially the Phoenician cities. And the odd inclusion of Dionysus, denoted here by the ivy wreath that uh, bounds his head. I'd say odd because Dionysus and Dionysian imagery is also exceedingly rare on Seleucid coins before this period, we of course immediately think of Dionysus' excursion into India and the use of this Dionysian triumph in blurring the lines between myth and reality when it came to Seleucus I and later Antiochus III's interactions with Indian kings. There are also a few inscriptions from Asia Minor that attest to Antiochus III honoring temples of Dionysus, though such measures are, on, are par on course for the way Hellenistic kings interacted with certain temples and show no heavy inclination towards a particular deity. So Lucas could certainly be pointing to this recent eastward anabasis of his father. Dionysus, however, is also arguably one of the most transmutable gods, similar to Zeus among a variety of cultures, a god of fertility and wine, he certainly would have resonated in the territories where these coins circulated among a variety of peoples of varying faith and where wine was a major export and import. Though not featured on coinage, Dionysian imagery factored into Ptolemaic self-representation and such imagery would certainly be developed by later Seleucids to advertise their Ptolemaic lineage to substantiate their claims to the throne. Here I remind you of that coin of Antiochus the sixth Dionysus that I began this presentation with, specifically the radiated crown. That's also one of the new uh, innovations. One has to wonder if such imagery found particular purchase in formerly Ptolemaic regions. Denomination C features Artemis, the sister of Apollo and another prominent deity in the Seleucid pantheon on both the obverse and the reverse. Denomination C or E, there is some question about where these stand. Uh, the, the question of denomination itself is, is uh, one that is incredibly complicated as I'm very quickly uh, learning. 
features an elephant on the reverse, a symbol uh, similar to the prow, which reinforces the military might of the Seleucids, even after the Treaty of Epimea sought to reduce the number of both. It's fairly interesting that the stipulations, and then you have these coins that feature them. Um, um, excuse me. That being said, I do have some reservation in always linking the elephant to, uh, to solely military might. I do think that they are elevated to be more linked with the royal prestige, uh, prestige in general, since their upkeep is tremendous and the very logistics of getting elephants is a feat on its own right. Um, the obverse features another rarity uh, for Seleucid coinage before this period, a Seleucid queen. Most scholars are comfortable with labeling her as Laodike IV, the daughter of Antiochus III, who first married his short-lived successor Antiochus before then marrying her other brother, Seleucus IV. Um, she would later also marry Antiochus IV and was an absolute pillar of the state during this period. She is a fascinating uh, figure. Veiled and with a diadem, she evokes some of the earlier profiles of lagged queens, notably Arsinoe II, that are featured on Ptolemaic coins, but also stands on her own as the first priestess for the royal cult that Antiochus III began for the queen, Laodike III. It appears to me that the main anxiety presented in the iconography on these coins is legitimacy. Um, there is an emphasis on family, Apollo and Artemis, Dionysus and possibly Antiochus III's Eastern campaigns, and Laodike IV, who not only ties Seleucus to his family, being after all his sister, but also hints at the queen uh, as the producer of a legitimate heir. There is more work to be done on these aspects, but the iconographic spread featured on these serrated coins presents an interesting melding of old and new Seleucid elements, some fairly programmatic, others curiously appearing during this time. I do not believe this is a coincidence that they circulated primarily in regions that had before been under Ptolemaic administration. Some closing summations and thoughts. This project seeks to situate the introduction of serrated bronzes within the wider context of Seleucid minting and administrative practices during the reign of Seleucus IV. I have characterized uh, his reign as one of consolidation and reformation. This was likely spurred by the indemnities of the Treaty of Apamea, which both limited Seleucid military movements and by extension, one of the main ways to quickly accrue money in antiquity and likely placed a financial strain on the empire given new research into the limited monetization of Hellenistic states. These strains naturally coaxed a reaction from the state, which attempted to exert more administrative oversight over certain resources in the empire, especially as we saw temples and their wealth. And this occurs also in Antigone Macedonia, and you also see these serrated coins in there. Um, these new bronzes demanded substantial changes in the minting practices of Antiochia. The new serrated edges, central cavities, double control marks, and iconographic elements make the coins both distinguishable and arguably harder to counterfeit uh, and familiar to those dwelling in these new regions where they circulated. Their fixed visual elements denoted the legitimacy of the new ruler presenting a mixture of established Seleucid iconographical elements and newer inclusions that I have teased as having local appeal in newer regions, though as ever we must be guarded about such readings. I have underscored that the main reason for such innovations as has to do with anxiety over establishing trust in these coins in newly conquered regions and the legitimacy of the Seleucid court at large. The so-called bottle cap coins thus fit into a wider pattern of increased centralization and administrative oversight that defined, and thanks to hostile ancient sources, maligned much of Seleucus's reign. Beyond simply style, these serrated coins held a tangible function and are indicative of a trend that begins during the second century of Seleucid fiscal experimentation and increased monetization which will result in one of the most dynamic periods for Seleucid coinage, showing that small change can be indicative of big change. Uh, thank you all very much for your time and attention. Excellent job, Eduardo. Um, we enjoyed that for another round. 
<laughs> Although much improved, I have to say, over the first I, I'm so sorry for my summer, uh, wonderful summer cohort people that had to yeah. once more bombard them with this. No, it's it's, it's an excellent study. Um, I'm sure there's questions. Um, any questions from the audience? I think I see Lawrence Edwards with, oh, no, he's clapping. Never mind. Sorry. All right. Well, I have a question. Um, yep. How long after his ascent to the throne did these coins begin to appear? So there's, uh, I, I followed uh, the SEC here. I believe it was Hoover who wrote the chapter uh, specifically looking at this, but there, the, there seems to be a theory floating that there was a, a stopping of minting at Antioch in the later reign of Antiochus III. And it doesn't seem to have mm -hmm. been uh, reinstated. I believe the date uh, being proposed was 178, 177. And so Lucas died in 175. So roughly three years, yeah. Mm -hmm. again, again, but okay. the dating is still, as, as as is the nature with a lot of this material. Sketchy. Exactamente, very. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some yeah. uh, questions in the chat here. Warren Esty, for example, is asking, is making the bottle cap plans more difficult or much more difficult? It does involve uh, the creation of double-sided molds. Uh, it, you have to be, I mean, yeah, I would say yes, because I see the other material that's being introduced alongside the serrations. For example, the divots. It's really interesting that you see divots starting uh, at least in like noticeable quantity uh, coinciding with the production of these serrations. Again, I don't think it's necessary, but I do think that these serrated edges are much, I don't want to say much more difficult. They are more difficult to produce than, than your standard bronzes that the Seleucids are producing before. At least it does require more effort um, to produce the molds, to, to ensure that, although again, they're bronzes, so they're not looking at every what quality control is not super great, um, but there still has to be much more of a conscious effort to, to get this product out than earlier bronzes, I would say. Yeah. And I think that also goes with, uh, if you don't mind, Peter, uh, me reading the next comment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. It, yeah, making it difficult to counterfeit. I do think that is a, a bonus uh, that you see here. Um, I do not believe there are any examples of very blatant counterfeiting for these bronzes. It would surprise me. I think there is one that has been labeled um, quote unquote barbarous imitation, um, but that's the only one that we have that's uh, available in the SEC. Um, I, I did start counting the serrations. Uh, I think Leave uh, 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 brought it up when uh, we were at the, the conference for Alon's retirement and, and then she brought it up. So I spent a solid morning. I think. It, Peter was in his office and you could just the desperation in my eyes that just sat there with a notepad and went da, 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 uno, dos, tres, cuatro, uh, over and over. There is a noticeable pattern. I, I don't think it's it's as constant to ensure that someone could go, ah, unless it's like a very sloppily made counterfeit. And again, these are lower uh, uh, value coins. So so counterfeiting, I would imagine by, by uh, um, it's very intensification. I don't think they would demand as strong a thing, but it's certainly the serrations would help distinguish them more as the just counterfeiters have to deal with the, the, the two control marks, the serrations, the divots. Uh, I think there's a lot there for them to have to deal with. So certainly the entire shape of the coin would have made it harder. Oh, Jeremy, uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, Jeremy Hogg's idea to count serration. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mark, or I'm oh, sorry, Mike Markovitz is also asking, do we have any idea about the purchasing power of these? Oh, this is this is uh, this is currently the the newest subject of my infuriation uh, 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 because bronze is already the, these bronze denominations are very hard to pin down. You can tell I use them. It, 
the, the graphs presented in SEC. There are also, it's tricky because the Seleucid bronzes undergo very quick periods of changes. And Tychus III introduces another uh, uh, denominational system. Uh, and then Alexander I reverts it back uh, so, and there's a lot of ping-ponging that goes on. And there does appear to be fixity for these denominations in Phoenicia. Uh, so Phoenicia has its own set of denominations, which goes in line with the closed currency also. Uh, so I'm still working through that. If anybody has any insight into how these would work alongside, let's say, Ptolemaic silver or that's going on. Because again, one of the things that I wanted to bring out was that um, uh, uh, Coily Syria and Phoenicia, this was kept a uh, closed monetary system similar to the Seleucus. So it wasn't an open monetary system that allowed coins to filter in based on the attic weight standard. So they kind of kept the environment contained. So that's, um, one of the driving questions is how these bronzes, which again, from the available find spots that we have show that they were mostly used in these regions, how they interacted with Ptolemaic silver. That's a, a, a continual question that, I, that I'm struggling with, so, yeah. Oh, and, and Liev has a, a follow comment clarifying uh, um, Jeremy Hag's idea uh, in the comments for those curious. And uh, Susan Sims also had a comment here about uh, these saying that she's got 25 in her collection and uh, she thinks that uh, this uh, would be his desire to distinguish his reign. They are quite blustery and proud coins indeed, stick out in history and are remarkable in their innovation. Fantastic presentation, indeed. Grazie mille. It, it really, like, they really are something. I, I'm very grateful to be a, a participant in the ANS to actually interact with these coins because the, the, the feel of them, the, 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 the yeah, I, I, I hold up the US quarter, but the serrations are nowhere near as deep uh, on them. You, you, and it, I, I would have to look more into them, but I, I do believe that they're also slightly more concave because the serrations bring them up a little bit more. Uh, so again, yeah, for sure. Thank you. No, and in fact, that's uh, one, of, one of the things that we really do try to encourage the students to do during the summer seminars, get out of the library and get their nose out of books and uh, handle the coins. Um, and Eduardo certainly did this summer by counting serrations <laughs> and all the rest of that. So um, certainly got a tactile uh, sense and feel for these coins um, very clearly. Yeah, I, I pester poor Peter so much, just uh, timidly knocking on his door going, can you get me another yeah, row of coins? And... <laughs> that's the whole point. That's the whole point. So. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. I think, uh, I think uh, Alice, Alice did, did, yeah, Alice, I think has got a question. Yeah, thanks. So uh, sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but I'm, I'm curious about um, if we have a sense of how big these issues of coinage were, because even beyond this, like the molds for the serrations, I feel like the polishing all of these on a lathe seems like a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, you said that maybe that wasn't true for all of them, especially the ones that don't have the cavity, but I, I'm wondering if there's a sense of like how how many of these they were actually producing um, and if yeah. it was quite small due to this kind of extra trouble. So for Seleucus IV, uh, the production is, of course, not as rampant as that of uh, Antiochus IV, because maybe these coins were brought in maybe 178, 177, and they only had three years to really get the thing going. Um, but for later periods, especially, you do see serrations being produced in substantial uh, quantities, uh, which is what uh, has led Dura to, to well, they coincided along with non-serrated coins, so I have to introduce that stipulation. This is uh, the, the there are variety of systems that are going on under Antiochus the Fourth, um, but they do seem to produce in substantial numbers. They do seem to produce or show up 
fairly frequently, especially for the later Seleucids, uh, Seleucids. And again, this practice goes beyond Seleucus IV, and it continues on for 60 years. So these, the, the shape has to have found some purchase um, and some appeal um, beyond that to, to stick around and to have the, the mint at Antioch continually produce these coins with um, the um, with these molds, uh, 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 old and new ones, because the, the, the iconography changes from ruler to ruler with these serrations also. Um, but yeah, I'd have to have to look more into quantifying, um, which is a little bit hard for uh, uh, bronzes as I learned over the summer, but I, I will continue to do so. But yeah, thank you, Alice. It's also nice to, uh, to see you uh, in person. Uh, we've interacted before uh, online, but it's nice to see you. So thank you for, for coming. Uh, Warren, do you, have a, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, we've used the term serrations for Roman Republican coins, which are cut into the edge. And anybody can interpret that as an attempt to see the interior and possibly find out if it's a foray. This is completely different. And I wonder if it needs a different term because it's not the sort of serration that's cut in. Yeah. It's projecting out from the original flan. See, so um, I'm wondering what Eduardo thinks about using the term serration for what we're discussing. Oh yeah, oh, there, there's, uh, I'm quickly learning uh, as I write my dissertation that every single term is problematic. <laughs> Any any vague term that you use will be problematic. And you're right in pointing out the serration does, by its very mention, invite this overlap, which then has to be clarified by the presenter, right? Um, I mean, I really like bottle cap. <laughs> it, it, it's very non-academic, or oh, what have you. I, I really just like calling them bottle cap. But if, if anybody's played Fallout, they also uh, bottle cap in a post-apocalyptic world, uh, bottle caps are used as currency. So there's also a wonderful archaeogaming. Oh, I actually talked with Andrew Reinhardt <laughs> about this uh, during my stint there. Uh, uh, I'm fine with bottle cap. I, if, if anybody has a better uh, uh, a term for them, I, I would. Um, although I do think that it helps having this overlap of terminology with the Roman coins does help us then differentiate them and what makes them the unique because in the explanation that no these are mold you get into the real uh, uh meat and potatoes of why they're different and why they're so special and why they're so fascinating uh and frustrating to me but but i i wholeheartedly agree that it can introduce confusion especially to those that aren't as familiar with Sol uh, seleucid bronzes um and more familiar with roman denarii which i i would imagine are most people Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, Eduardo, I want to thank you again for a, another great presentation. Um, look forward to seeing this in print someday. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.